Come on, say with me, He's holy. Say, Lord, you are worthy. Oh, come on, say it again. Say, Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, we give you the glory. Save me. Lord, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. Thank you for your presence, Lord. There's a person here, there's more than one. There's something wrong of your, there's, I see the lungs. But the lower part of the lungs, there's, I see like a, almost like a, I want to say nodule, but I, I see with the lungs, there's something not right of your lungs. Something not right of your lungs. If you have lung problems, why don't you quickly just jump out of your seat, come to me. Lung problems, lung problems. Lung problems. Save me, God's good. And His mercy endures forever. Save me again. God's good. And His mercy endures forever. Lungs, 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 lungs. Um, while they're here, there's a person here, it's more than one. You're, I'm going to describe to you what you feel. Sometimes your ears, it goes close and then it stays closed for a long time. And this gives you almost like a headache or a, um, the best way I can describe it is like, it's not just a migraine, but your, but your ears go closed and then they stay closed for prolonged times. Prolonged times. The Lord's showing me in the spirit where that problem is. So I want to pray for you that this will never come back. Um, the Lord's interested in our whole bodies. Save me. Amen. Okay, he's, he's interested in your spirit. He's interested in your soul. He's interested in your body. He wants to make you whole. Jesus paid the price in all three dimensions. Are you there? Spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. But I want to pray for that as well as I pray for the lungs. Ears. Ears, ears, ears. If you have a problem with your ears, your ears go close and then they stay close. Quickly come to me, please. I am always surprised how much God knows us. He knows the intrigue details of your life. Are you there? There's more than one of ears. It was like three or four I saw in the Spirit. Um, I want us just to trust God. Saving God's good and His mercy endures forever. As I shared with you last week, Sunday night, I'll share again. Remember, the Lord heals. Not sometimes, all the time. Do you agree? Say me, the Lord heals all the time. Can we have that perfect theology tonight, church? Come on. That the Lord is a healer and that He heals and that He heals always. You know, one of the things that before I pray, I want us just to get the theology right. God does not heal people because you are good. I'll say it again. God does not heal people because you are good. God heals people because He is good. God heals people because He doesn't have an ill thought towards you. His thoughts is good. Save me, His thoughts is good. So he doesn't, he doesn't count you on the way that you count you. He counts you on the way He counted the Son. So however He sees Jesus, He sees you. The Bible says not one of His bones were broken. Why? So that all of your bones may be whole. Come on, are you there? His head was scarred wise so that the curse could be lifted from you. His beard was plucked out so that your face may be restored to Him. Oh, come on, are you guys just with me? His back was whipped and torn to pieces so that you will never need to turn your back for that that He bought. You are bought by the blood. Say, I'm bought by the blood. If you are bought by the blood, we should not pay for anything that is not ours to suffer by. Hallelujah. Come on, are you there? I want our, our, our faith in God before we pray. I want our faith in God to go extreme. God is so interested in you. He wants to heal a headache as much as He wants to heal cancer. It's the same God. Come on church, are you guys with me? Now stand to your feet. In this church we don't, we say we, we participate. Don't spectate. Say me again, we participate. We don't spectate. Come on, stretch out your hands. Come on, the Bible says, the reason why I make you do this is because if one part of the body suffers, all of you 
suffer. If all of you rejoice, one rejoice, all of us rejoice. And we're going to rejoice in a moment from now because God's going to touch all of them. Yes? Come on, stretch out your hands. Pray. Pray in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, you release faith. Come on, release faith, church. We thank you, Lord Jesus. That was light. Light was here.
pray for people. Um, I want to pray specifically, and it might be people online as well. Um, arthritis, lupus, um, remifod arthritis, and any arthritis. What I see in the spirit, I see like your hands are fine. And normally when, when this sickness comes upon people, they are, they are fine, but they can remember a day that suddenly the pain came. And then that thing just grows worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And this is one of the sicknesses of have asked the Lord. We have authority over all of them. Are you with me? But this is one of them I've contended for in prayer a lot in my life. And so I believe the Lord wants to straighten your bones. Okay, not a lot of faith. I believe the Lord wants to straighten your bones and take the pain away. You don't need a pull, you need the gospel. Here's the conditions as you come out. Uh, you can remember the day that suddenly the pain was there. Hands, might be knees, might, I don't know. This devil has got a lot of manifestations. But I want to pray with you tonight that, and you have to as you come out, you, you, must, not be, you must not have a mentality that you're going to walk away sick. You must have a mentality that the Lord will heal you on the spot. The Lord heals and His goodness endures forever. It's more than four or five people. I saw a few people in the Spirit. Come on, can I have the church? Can you pray with me? Come on. These are, it must change like with immediate effect. Just oil. Father, we thank you in this night for these precious people, first and foremost. We thank you for their lives. We thank you that they called. I thank you, Lord, for the power that is upon their lives. Father, I thank you that Jesus is the healer. And Father, we speak first and foremost healing over these bodies in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we declare that arthritis will go at the touch of your name upon these people. Father, I thank as I lay my hands that arthritis will go in this night. And whatever name it has, Lord, we thank you that it bows its name and it bows its effects under Jesus' mighty name. Father, I speak over these areas right now, Lord, that they dry up and they go away in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that as the anointing comes upon, it breaks the yoke. It breaks the yoke. It breaks the yoke in Jesus' mighty name. May it disappear and never come back. May it disappear and never come back in the mighty name of Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for complete healing. Complete healing. Complete healing in the mighty name of Christ Jesus complete healing in the mighty name of Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Healing, head to toe, 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 in the mighty name of Jesus. Head to toe, head to toe. We thank you, Lord. Just help. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, thank you, Lord. Speak up. We thank you, Lord. There you go. There you go. Touch the Lord. Touch the Jesus. Touch the deeply. Save me. The Lord's good. And His mercy endures forever. Save me again. The Lord's good. And His mercy endures forever. Save me one more time. The Lord's good. And His mercy endures forever. One last time of a loud authority. The Lord's good and His mercy endures forever. Come on, give Him some praise. Amen and amen. Well, you can be seated just for a, for a moment and uh, I well, first and foremost, we're going to baptize people tonight. 
And uh, come on, give, give people a hand that's, uh, or give uh, applause for people that's getting baptized tonight. Uh, baptism is so important. Your whole life changes at the point of baptism. Hallelujah. And um, I want to speak to you tonight about the, the Nazarite vow or the Nazarite breed um, as we're leading up into our baptisms tonight. Because again, I say baptism is so vital, so important. It's one of the key things you can do as a Christian. To be baptized doesn't get you saved, um, but it shows you are saved. Let me say that again. You don't need baptism to be saved, but it does show you are saved. Um, and so if you have not yet signed up for baptism tonight, you are welcome to sign up during the course of our evening. Um, we've got um, a couple of people, 60, 70 people. We want that number to grow to 100, 120, 150, 200. Uh, there's enough space for everybody. Amen. And let me just explain baptism. You can get baptized once or you can feel that the Lord leading you again to the water of baptism, then get baptized again. It's all good. Um, I did it twice in my life. When I was 12 years old, I was baptized by my dad, filled of the Holy Spirit at the age of nine. But I got rebaptized at the age of 18. Just to dedicate my life again to the Lord. So it's all about this dedication. But tonight I want to speak to you about the Nazarite breed. Say with me, Nazarite breed. And you might ask, what is the Nazarite breed? Well, it's all of this is found in, in Numbers chapter number 6. Numbers chapter number 6. And um, in Numbers chapter number 6, you find the Nazarite breed or the Nazarite call. And when I say the word Nazarite breed and Nazarite call, I want to give you just a little bit of history of where I'm coming from with this, that you have insight to um, maybe just to a basis of where we are. Many, many years ago, I, I recall the day and the hour still that I asked the Lord, I mean, this is many years ago, 20 years ago. I asked the Lord the question, Lord, um, when will you come? And I know that's a question that, or an answer that He can't really give because no man knows the hour nor the time. But we do know according to Scripture what will happen the closer we get to the time, we will see the signs and the symptoms. And so we have seen the signs and the symptoms and they have really come and gone. And many people have called this time the latter time or the last days. And really it's been the last days for 2024 years. And so, but that was a question that I asked the Lord 20 years ago. And the Lord said to me that um, before I come, one of the signs that you will see is there will come a generation that will be filled with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Then the Lord said to me, this generation will be not just full of the Holy Spirit and full of fire. This generation will be holy. They'll be set aside, set apart. And then of course, when you, when you hear the Lord speak like that in the context of the fullness of the Scripture, because the fullness of the Scripture is important for us to understand the body of Scripture, we have to understand that Moses asked the Lord something. And this was the Lord's Moses request. He asked the Lord, Lord, place your spirit upon people. He actually asked the Lord, Lord, take the spirit that is upon me and place it upon people. In other words, it was Moses' cry unto God. It was a prayer of Moses to see the spirit of the Lord dispersed upon the people. And then many years later on, you find the prophet Joel prophesying that there will come a day and there will come an hour that the Lord will place His spirit upon people and the young men will see visions and the old people will dream dreams again. And in those days, the Bible says, that all shall prophesy. Now, all, the, all of you that are Christians here have the ability to prophesy, Revelations 19.10, but it doesn't make us a, prof a prophet. You just have a prophetic spirit inside of you. Uh, let me just say this, and I'll, I'll say this honestly, is that um, you don't want to be a prophet unless you're called to be one. Because when you are, as soon as you step into the office, persecution will come. Um, the, the cross of the prophet is persecution. Death is the cross of the apostle. And, um, and so we have to understand when whatever we require from, I want to jump into this, whatever we require from God, God's going to require back. And so as I, was, as I was with the Lord on this, the, I, the Lord started to take us onto this journey of righteousness. I'm trying to sketch just a big picture here for you. And in righteousness, we started to teach the church and started to teach you 
that it's not based on what you do, it's based on what He has done and you walking in His righteousness. So it's not so much about right living as right believing the, which results into right living. In other words, I, I'm, I'm living right because I understand right. Well, let me say rather like this. I am living right because I believe right. And because I believe right, I have a boldness. Yes, I get a boldness about myself because my accreditation before the Father is not based on my works. It's based on the finished work of Jesus. Then this morning I spoke about that in the beginning God, the word Elohim, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word Elohim there means the three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were all active in creation. And the Elohim Ruach or Ruach Elohim hovered over the face of the deep. But it's the Son that spoke, the Yahweh Elohim that said, Light be and light was. Yes? Then in Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 2, you find the Bible says God finished His work and He rested from His work. But then in verse number 7 again, you find that God is again forming man. But this is not God Elohim. This is Yahweh Elohim or Jesus Christ that is forming man into His image and into His likeness. And so He then works the works of man or works the works of man and God because He's fully man, fully God, all the way up to the cross where the Bible says He declares it is finished. What is finished? The original work that was given to Adam is now finished in the last Adam. Then you don't start at the first Adam. You start at the last Adam. You start at Jesus. Are you there? Come on, I, I did that just for free for all of you to give you a summary of the Bible. Just very, very quickly. But it brings me to the Nazarite breed and to the Nazarite vow. The Nazar, which means set apart. Jesus was set apart. He was an, a Nazarite. Nazarite means, or the Nazarite breed, is a set-apart people. It's interesting that the Bible says that you are a holy priesthood set apart. So you and I are called to be set apart. We are not in this world, of this world, but we are in this world, right? And so the, one of the best examples of a Nazarene or a one that has taken the Nazarite vow was Samson. And interesting enough, the Nazarite vow or the Nazarite breed, uh, if you will, the Nazarite vow could record it in Numbers chapter number six, is one of the rarest and one of the holiest vows that is biblically taken because it's a vow of purity. Are you okay? And we see with Samson an example, and this is the example that we see of Samson. Samson is called a Nazarene or he's He's born to destroy the Philistines or the works of the Philistines. That's his call. He's called by God to destroy the works of the Philistines. But he's a Nazarite. He has got a Nazarite vow. And because he has a Nazarite vow, please listen to me very, very carefully. Because he has a Nazarite vow, his hair may not be touched and he cannot drink wine. And it's not because his hair could not be touched. The power is not in the hair. The power is in the worship. Because Samson, the name Samson means a son. So it was a son set apart for his father. Are you okay? Then many, many years later on, you find John the Baptist coming and he is a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare he the way for the son. In other words, you see a son and then later on in the Bible, you see a voice crying out, preparing the way for the Son. And both are Nazarites. Both are set apart. Both are holy. And so maybe I, I can say it like this. Samson's life was not one that should have actually been described as a, as a person that was religiously holy because he had the anointing. And here's the big difference. And I want us just to understand that, and I wrote just a note down, for you that you will not miss this tonight is to be a Nazarite means to be a worshiper. I'll say it again. To be a Nazarite means to be a worshiper because whatever you worship, you become like. Worship is not the songs we sing. It's the revelation I have of the all-consuming fire God that I serve. Right? 
And so to worship the Lord or worship is part to be Nazarite. And so what happened to Samson, please listen to me very, very carefully. Samson had the anointing. He was anointed. And I'll shock you with this, but it's true. Samson was not a huge muscular man. He was a normal person. Because the people constantly ask him, where did you get your power from? If he was this huge man of a muscles and thing, of course the people would not ask a question like that. But they ask him the question, please listen to me carefully, they ask him, where's your power? It means that he's normal. But when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon, he changes into the other man. The anointing will change you into the other man. Hallelujah. Are you, are you there? Okay. But the anointing upon you is not enough because it was not enough for Samson. The anointing came upon him. He did great and mighty feats. But here's the problem, and I want, you to, I want you to look at both of Jesus. And we can't go into all of the Nazarite vows tonight, or even in the full body of the understanding of what it is. I just want to touch on it. And I, I want to say this. I've been prophesying from this platform that there will come a time that young people will rise up in power and will fire and full of the Holy Spirit and do great and mighty signs and wonders. I want you to understand that will not come because of anything but they've set themselves apart in holiness and in purity. Let me say it like this. The greater the request, the greater the set apart. John was set apart from the start. He understood his call. He ate honey, 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 honey. He ate honey. He was in the wilderness. He, he wore camel's uh, clothes. He was not with the people. Why? Set apart. Why? He was preparing a way. A significant way was being prepared. Therefore, he lived his life set apart. Are you there? The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. We understand this. But John the Baptist was set apart because he was preparing a way. There will come a generation in this hour that will say by themselves, we will be set apart and holy. They will prepare the way for the Lord. The Lord is coming, not for a broken, busted lip, torn veil, torn dress bride. He's coming for a pure, holy, sanctified, set apart bride. How do we know? Because He's Emmanuel, God with us. He does not want to get you holy by your own efforts. That's the law. He wants to get you holy by you surrendering into Him who is in you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Are you there? And so what happens to Samson is really a, a sad story, but I, I want to take one or two principles out of his life. The first thing that we see of Samson is Samson is alone of Delilah. Yes? There's a principle here for us. Isolation leads to desolation. Nobody is called to function in isolation. All of us are called to function as an interdependent body. Christ is the head. All of us are assigned a position and a part to play. That's why you're not here to compete. You're here to complete. Yes? Okay. Now, the first thing that we see of Samson and Delilah, they are isolated. It's interesting for me that it is the nature of the devil. Whenever he's about to take you out, he removes you out. Come on, are you there? Because he always attacks like that. Why? It's his nature. An orphan wants to make other people orphans because he doesn't have a family. Come on, guys, don't look at me so holy. The enemy doesn't have a family. Everything he has, he doesn't have anymore. He needs, are you guys okay? So we see of Samson and of Delilah, we see isolation, first mistake. Second mistake, Samson is used to the anointing. He's not a worshiper. Because when, when, when Delilah, she makes him tired. And by the way, um, the enemy does not attack, and it's not about the enemy really. I don't even want to focus on Satan, but I'll just say this by the way. The enemy does not come to you when you are strong. He waits for you till you're weak. So when you are weak, he asks the question again. 
because it's in his nature, the word diabolos, devil, the, it's in his nature to ask the question multiple times and then to wait for an opportune time. And when you are weak, he comes and asks the question again. Therefore, you and I have to say, when I'm weak, yet I am strong. Because it's your weakness that qualifies you for greatness. I'll say that again. It's not your greatness that qualifies you for your weakness. It's your weakness that qualifies you for your greatness. Because right through the Bible, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things because He's the extraordinary God that wants to have extraordinary results with ordinary people. And that right for your Bible, you see that example. And so what happens to Samson is first and foremost, Samson, very, very simple. He, please listen, is isolated. 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 And in this hour, please don't get isolated because we have a job to do, as I said this morning. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and God the Father finished His work and His Sabbath. The reason why God rested is because He finished. Later on in the ministry of Jesus, they asked Jesus, why are you not Sabbathing? He makes this statement. He says, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. In other words, God Sabbath because man should, was supposed to be working. But because man was not working, God, Lord Yahweh, stepped out of Sabbath and started to work so that one day in the future He can hang on the cross, finish the work, and you and I could be filled with the Ruach Elohim, and you and I can go to work so that the Son can sit at the right hand of the Father, rest from His work until such a time that the Father makes His enemies His footstool. His enemies has made His footstool past, present, and future based. That's why salvation is justification, sanctification, glorification. It's three dimensions. Are you there? Everything is, but it's still going to be. And everything that's going to be was already. Okay, you'll need higher grade for that just for a moment. The point is, He is the beginning and the end. Everything simultaneously. Before He made you, He finished you. Let me say it like this. He has to speak you before He can make you. And once He has spoken, He has already made it. That's why right through the Bible, you'll never find God touching stuff. He speaks to things. Why? Because He's not a president trying to win over a parliament. He's the king, the king. Come on. The galaxies is not going to vote on God. He's authoritarian. He's not a, um, he's not a Republican or a Democrat. What he says stands. Come on, guys, are you, are you with me? It's not a man that he can say something and we're like, ah, oh, we wonder if he. No, if he says it, it's done. Are you there? The whole creation still functions on two words light be. Let me say it like this We know this earth will not finish because unless he finishes it, why? He's still here. Come on, just bump that person next to you that's sitting so stock stiff is on his car. Say, word wakker. Say, wake up. Okay, so Sam, Samson, Samson was, please listen to me, Samson, he was a man that had a huge anointing, but he was not a worshiper. David was a worshiper. I want you to note the difference between the two. Samson was, had a massive anointing upon his life. Huge. But he needed to actually destroy the works of the Philistines. But he did not because he could not control his heart, nor could he control his flesh. Are you there? And so he went to a place outside the reach of his own family. Okay, it's going, getting quiet. Okay, how do we know? Because it's simple. They tell him, listen, Samson, don't marry Delilah. They are actually saying to him, don't go outside of the covenant. Because the covenant that the Lord had of His people was a place that Israel had the victory. Come on, are you guys okay? Samson goes out of the place of worship. Are you guys getting what I'm saying? And as he goes out of the place of worship, you see a difference between Samson and David. And here's the big difference. The difference between the two is the anointing lifts from Samson and he knows it not. That tells me he doesn't know the anointing. I'll say it again. 
The anointing lifts from Samson. He knows it not. Because he awakens and he wants to do that what he has always done. But now the anointing left. Are you there? And they pluck out his eyes. They bind him. They put him to a mule or, or to a grinding, a, grinding, uh, a grinding post. And he does what the donkey is supposed to be doing. But God has mercy. Yes, see, God is great. Save me. God's great. And His mercy endures forever. Okay, now what happens with Samson? Samson's story, thank God, doesn't end with the grinding mill. Because the Scripture puts in for us in Judges 16 that his hair began to grow again. That's a shine of mercy for you. It's a showcase of mercy. It's a showcase of grace. And then Samson, right at the end of his life, and I'll go to David now. Samson, right at the end of his life, when his hair began to grow again, remembers God. And Samson cries out to God and he says, Lord, remember me one more time. And the Lord says, of course, I'll remember you. And Samson destroys in his death more Philistines than what he did in his lifetime. So he ends well. Save me this morning. I preached about finish well. Save me finish well. So as Samson finishes well, then here's the amazing thing about God. God almost like blots out all of his failures. And in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter number 11, just writes Samson in as a hero of the faith. Amazing grace. Samson should not be there. He actually failed. But did he? Question. According to our standards, he did. But God gracefully writes him in at the end. Sarah is another example. When the Lord says to Sarah, you'll be of child, Sarah laughs. She's like, ha, 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 whatever. Who's going to do it, Lord? And the Bible does not write that in for you in the New Testament. The Bible says in the New Testament, Sarah believed the Lord. She laughed at the Lord. But yes, David, let's look at David for an example. David, when he sins, he knows the anointing is about to lift. How do we know? Psalm 51. He starts to cry out to God. What is his prayer? He says, never remove your spirit away from me. Why? David understood a secret. As soon as the spirit of the Lord lifts, he is finished. Come on, are you with me? I'll say that again. He knew. As soon as the Lord lifts from him, he's done, he's over, he's finished. And so his plea before the Father became, Lord, remember me. Never take your spirit away from me. And David becomes, he pleads of God. And the Bible says, God says, David is a man after his own heart. Why is David a man after his own heart? Because David cherishes what God cherishes. What does David cherish? He cherishes the person of the anointing, the person of the Holy Spirit. And because he cherishes that, he's a worshiper. And he understood that his victory lies in worship. Part of the Nazarite breed that God is busy raising up in this generation is a group of people that are going to worship the Lord. May I, may I say, say it like this? <laughs> Jesus did not come to create miracle workers. Jesus did not come that blind eyes will see only. Jesus did not come that deaf ears will come only. That's not why He came. He came, He said it Himself in John 4, 24, 4 23, 24. I've come to seek worshippers. The Father seeks worshippers. I've come for them. Then He says, He makes another statement. Yes, the Lord's statements are deep at times. He says this, I've not come for those that believe they are righteous. I've come for them that are lost. In other words, I have to decrease my own, uh, own sight of myself to be a recipient of the goodness and the grace of God. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. And so what is the Nazarite breed that is busy rising up is a generation that will be holy through a lifestyle of consistent worship. Hmm. That's why you can go an hour and 30 just like that. This morning you went two, three hours. We went like it, like that. Why? There's a generation rising up of worshippers. Worshippers. And because we are worshippers, what's happening is that this generation that is around us, please listen to me, everything that the devil is designing is for worship. 
You can listen to this tape when I'm gone in the rapture. The, everything He designs is for worship because that's what He wants. He asked it from the Lord. That was a joke, by the way. He asked it of the Lord. He said, I want you to bow down and worship me. If you worship me, I give you the kingdoms. Jesus said, I'm not going to do it like that. I'm going to take the kingdoms from you. I'm going to take the keys. I'm going to break the power of hell, but not your way. I'm going to do it the obedient way. I'm going to die as a man. And when I die, he didn't say this to the devil, of course, because if the devil knew, he would never crucify the son. He would actually stop. The enemy's greatest mistake is the cross. It was a signpost of victory. No, it was a signpost of defeat. That's the place that Jesus won. Are you there? Now let's go into this. Uh, then two more things that I, I want you to understand here is that as you are, and I, and I believe that we are a generation of Nazarites. We are a, a generation that is set aside. And maybe I can say it like this. It's not what you can exclude by a religious no. It's what you exclude by a confident yes. I'll say it again. It's not what you can exclude with a religious no. Can you, can't you? That's not the, dis the discussion. But is your yes so loud that it doesn't make space for the no's? Come on, guys. Are you okay? Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not the question, can you, can you not? No. The Bible says that you let, let your yes be so loud that it doesn't make room. Now, of course, we can say tonight, but in this few statements that I've got left, you can say, but I, uh, it almost sounds like a little bit extreme. Well, the cross is extreme. You can say, yes, I don't, I don't know if, I, if I'm really there that I, let, let me say it like this. The devil is not impressed with how loud we pray. Your enemy is not impressed by that. He watches your lifestyle. He looks at you. And through a lifestyle, you have a reputation. And the reputation you gain in the spirit is what the spiritual world looks at. It's true. That's why if you see us struggle for 10 hours of devils, that means you don't have a reputation in the spirit. As soon as you get one, and the best way to get one is worship the Lord. Come on, say amen. Okay, I don't want you to freeze to your seat. It seems like you guys are struggling. So I'm going to have three more points that I, I want us just to understand this. Point number one, as you get baptized tonight, you must know it's your soul announcing to heaven, I'm here. You are making an announcement that you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and you are getting through that waters of baptism and you're going to get out on the other side and you're going to live for Jesus. It's a holy thing. And I, I really believe, listen to me, that proximity equates to lifestyle. Say so, amen. Your proximity equates to lifestyle. In other words, when you, when you live close to the source, your lifestyle shifts and changes. Not because, listen, not, not because you have this set of rules of do's and don'ts. No, it's because you are closer. And the closer you get to the Lord, the more rules change for you. It's not that the rules change, it's the way that He reacts that changes. How do, you, how do we know? Good question. Thank you for asking. I'll answer. We know it changes because the Israelites are very close to the Lord on the Mount of Sinai. They see His glory. They see His miracles. Now they are worshiping a, a golden calf and God makes a judgment call. He says, you stubborn people, you will stay here and I will not change my word, but I'll change the time for the fulfillment of my word. And these guys, they stay in the desert for all of their life. So from three with the Mickey Mouse t-shirt all the way till they're dead. Then the Lord chooses a new generation. And so I want us to understand. Then secondly, when you get baptized tonight, you get the awesome opportunity, and this is what I'm going to pray for you a bit later. You get the opportunity to be part of the family of God. You get baptized into God's family. Come on, are you there? And by the way, we are the biggest family on the planet. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter number 6, verse number 4, For therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So after you get baptized tonight, you're going to live a new life. Why? It's part of purity. It's part of holiness. Then, I just want to emphasize it again because I get so many questions on this. Baptism, baptism does not save you. Only your faith in Jesus can do that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift from God. So that nobody can boast. Then, again I say, He introduces you to a new family. How do we know? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13 says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Are you there? The power of the body is in unity. I'll say that again. The power of the body is in unity. Save me unity. If your smallest member of your body is not, not in disagreement with the rest of your body, your whole body will know there's a disagreement. Are you unsure? Let's test it. If you bump your small toe, the rest of your body will send a message. I'm hurt. Can you imagine how powerful the body of Christ will be if we can function as one? Are you there? So what does the devil do? He just delays people and he makes us go around this long search for ourselves, believing that somehow that the longer we look into ourselves, we're going to get an answer. May I, I help you tonight? There's no answer inside of you. There's only a answer and he is a person. His name is Jesus. Stop going around that mountain. It will, it will tire you. I don't know for you, but it, it tires me. I, I don't do that anymore. I don't go around this mountain. What did they think? What did they say? How does this work out? I don't ask those questions. I couldn't care. Why? I have a task. You have a job. I have a job. We have a performance to do. We need to get the job done. Are you there? Don't waste time. Save me. Don't waste time. And so what we see of Samson before I'm going to call out the people that are getting baptized. When we, when we see Samson, we see a man that had the anointing upon him. But we see also a man that the anointing was not enough. You needed more. He needed more. He had to actually have a relationship with the anointing. Because once you have a relationship with the anointing, you will know when he leaves or when he loves. I want to say this and I'll, I'll, I'll close of this. And then I want to call the people out that are getting baptized. The Holy Spirit can never leave. He's a permanent indweller. But what He does do, He lifts. How do we know? He can be quenched. He can be grieved. He can be vexed. He can be blasphemed. And so what He often does, if we don't have a relationship with Him, what He does, He lifts. He does not leave. He lifts. That's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit came and remained on Jesus. If He can remain, He can also lift. And the focus is not when does He lift. The focus should be how can He remain. Let me say that again. The focus should not be how can He lift. The focus must be how can He remain. Good question. I'll answer. The way that He remains is if you remain in the Word. Abide in me as I abide in you and you can ask me anything in my name and I shall do it for you. So how does the Holy Spirit remain in you and remain upon you? You must remain in the Word. Yes, as you remain in the Word, you can't remain in your opinion. You remain in the Word. And sometimes even though we are in 2024, this Bible is not that commonplace, or let me say it like this. This Bible is not so popular anymore because it challenges the hearts of men. May I say this word has not changed, and it will never change. It cannot change. 
The earth may come and go, but the word of the Lord will remain the same. I'll say it again. The earth may come and go. This Bible will stay the same. It will not change for us. It will not change for our circumstances. It is the eternal, unfallible, perfect, breathed upon word of the Lord. It stays the same. But there's a call for God, and I believe it prophetically speaking, that there's a Nazarite crawl upon the planet. And if we don't answer it, there's a generation that will answer it. It's either going to be the Gen Z generation or the generation that's before them. But a generation will answer it and will say, yes, we are holy, set aside, set apart, called for a time such as this. Come on, are you guys there? There has to come a generation that are not, not familiar with God, but fears the Lord. And what I'm saying to you is not new, but I'm telling you that there is as much as God is putting His hands upon ordinary people to make them extraordinary in this time. And there is a rise of prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists. I like what one of my friends says. He says this. He says, we should not be impressed that you are a prophet or an apostle or a teacher or evangelist. We should be impressed. Can you bear fruit according to your kind? So who have you raised up? Who have you planted? Can you teach the Word? Are you there? And so I want to encourage you that there's a whole generation that is rising up. And that's why we need to know this Bible. Come on, say Amen. Okay. And what I want to encourage you tonight for is this. Say Amen. God's good and His mercy endures forever. What the Lord wants to do, the, the heaven is celebrating when people get baptized. Because we're adding, we're adding to the body, right? And so tonight, the worship team, you guys can come. I want to call out every single person that's getting baptized. Every single person is getting baptized. And as you come tonight, what I want us to do, we're going to do it in, in two phases tonight. What? We first and foremost celebrating that you are getting baptized. But secondly, we want you to renounce this world. We are not of this world. We're in it, but not of it. We are born of God. We are reborn. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We believe that Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelled amongst men. We believe that He went to the cross, that He died, and that He rose on the third day. We believe that He descended into hell, that He took the keys of hell, hates, and the grave. And He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And He is coming back. We believe in the triune God. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We believe in the New Testament. You are saved by grace and grace only. We be believe that marriage is holy. Set aside by the Lord. Between a natural man and a natural woman. Come on, I can go on and on and on. But when you get baptized, you are getting back to baptized in something that is holy. Come on, are you guys okay? We have to know what we stand for. Unless we know what we stand for, we will fall for all things. No, we stand for holiness. We stand for purity. We stand for being set aside. We stand not for the standards of this world. We are made different. If we look like this world, we will have no power to save this world. The only thing that you can do like this world is dress better than them. I'm teasing. That was a joke, by the way. But say amen. I want the people that are getting baptized tonight, I want you to jump out of your seats and come to the front. And as you come to the front tonight, um, everybody that's getting baptized, quickly jump up. You all have time to, to go back to your seats. And uh, won't you come out here to the front for me, please? I want the whole church to stand. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's celebrate people that are getting baptized. Look at that. Come on, church.
Come on, won't you give them a bigger applause? Would you let the guys just move over? You can move over, you can move over. Many, many people getting baptized. I want your church, a whole church, everybody online with us. I want everybody to stretch out your hand to these people that is in front. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to lead you through a public confession of your faith. Is that okay? And uh, as I lead you through a public confession of your faith, what I am going to lead you into is denying this world and saying yes to Jesus. Come on, are you guys there? Just change the tune for me, please. So we are going to say yes to the Lord. But I want the whole church. Can we do this together? Come on, remember what I just said. We are baptized into one family by one Spirit. We have one Father. We have one Savior. We have one Holy Spirit. And we have one eternal home. We don't have many. Hello, are you there? There's not five heavens, there's just one. So learn to like your neighbor. You might be with them forever. If you don't like them now, there might come a time that God places you next to them for ions of years, like millions of years. Every morning, that same voice. Good morning, Charles. That same voice. So get to love your neighbor. Yes, it's true. Okay, everybody here that's in front. Everybody online. Save me. I believe in God. The Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, my Lord, my God, my Savior, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the gathering of the saints, His church. I believe in the communion of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins by His blood. I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. I renounce, say me again, I renounce all my allegiance towards the devil. I renounce, oh, say with authority, I renounce any legal foothold the enemy might have. I see the work of Christ as final, as finished, and as complete. I acknowledge that the old is gone and the new has come. I receive His Word and His promises over my life. And as I enter into His life, for my life, I choose by my free will to give my life to Him and Him alone. I renounce this world and its fleeting offerings and I receive His Word for my life. I place my full confidence in the blood of Jesus by which I am, I am, I am accepted by the one that sits upon the throne both now and forevermore. 
the eternal God, Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer. This is my declaration. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Come on. That's so good. That's so good. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise. So now what we want before you go, we want to say thank you for choosing the waters of baptism. It's one of the most beautiful uh, things that you can do as a believer. And there's something I believe that God wants to do for every single one of you tonight. Amen. If you believe in Jesus, Jesus gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift. We get it freely. And tonight when you go through the waters of baptism, it's one of the things they're going to pray for you for. And say when you go through the waters of baptism, say, Lord, thank you for the free gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you lift your hands? Everybody in the church, would you raise your hands out? Just want to bless them. Father, we thank you that in this night, Lord, I can look at your people tonight and see all of these people getting baptized. Thank you for their obedience tonight to get baptized through waters. And Father, I pray in this night, Lord, that they will not only go through the waters of baptism and stay the same, but they'll go through the waters of baptism and change. And Father, in this night, just by touching them, Lord, we, we just bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that as they go through those waters of baptism, that everything shifts and changes for them. Thank you, Lord, that the old man is gone, the new man is come in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that they are your sons and your daughters, born from above, born anew, born afresh. And Father, I thank you that we, the church, can welcome them home and say you are home now and you are safe and you are part of the family of God. And Father, I thank you for your grace over their lives. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that all of them are saved by this marvelous thing called the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, that they don't need to labor to enter the rest, but that they can walk into the rest of God because they've chosen the Lord in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that the old things are gone and the new things have come in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, for every single one of them, so many, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that tonight a beautiful transaction happens between heaven and earth where they are announced. Father, in this night I pray as they go through the waters of baptism, announce them, Lord. Announce their souls. Announce them, Lord. Lord, we as Empowered Church, Lord, we celebrate their decision and we thank you, Lord, for their lives. But this night I pray, announce them, Lord. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people shout. Come on, say amen again. So as you go to your seats, we want to celebrate your church. Won't you celebrate every single person as you go to your, to your seats tonight? Can I ask the whole church to stand? I need one more of your minutes. And then we're going to go to a baptism tonight. This is the best burial that you will have. Come on, say amen. It's the best one that you're going to have because this one, the old man stays behind and the new man has come. Tonight, before we go to baptisms, and I, I want to ask every single one of you, take time and come with us to the waters of baptism. Take time and go see how people get baptized. We're going to do it there in the minor hall. You would see there was many people here in front it's beautiful to see people walking out in obedience. Come on, say amen. And as the family of God, we have a lot to celebrate tonight. We have the privilege to go and celebrate tens and tens of people saying yes to Jesus through baptism. Hallelujah. 
before we do so and for everybody that's with us online just one thing from my side is I want us to honor the Lord just of our giving before we're gonna go through and then we're gonna all go through and celebrate our brothers and our sisters hallelujah if you are ready to give unto the Lord as I said this morning we don't give to God we bring to the Lord because our life is the Lord's and so as you bring your tithe as you bring your offering tonight know that you are bringing something and um, and more than that I want to pray for you that as you bring your tithe bring your offering the scriptures declare in Malachi chapter number 3 there will be an open heaven over your life secondly the Bible says the righteous never beg for bread are you there the righteous never beg for bread say amen the righteous never beg for bread you have bountiful supply because you're in the kingdom Father, I want to pray for every single person tonight. I thank you, Lord, for every single person that's going to get baptized in a moment from now. But Lord, I thank you for every person that is bringing their tithes and their offering. Father, I want them to know that what they're doing is holy and what they're doing, they should be doing cheerfully. And so, Father, I thank you for cheerful givers in this night. But I also thank you, Lord, that we are part of this eternal covenant that calls us righteous. And so, Lord, as we bring our tithe, as we bring our offering, we do so as sons and daughters, honoring you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You're welcome to bring your tithe.